Who's involved in this race to perfect quantum computers? And the answer is everyone. This isn't just the next leap in computing. It's a doorway into something we barely understand. A machine that doesn't process zeros and ones, but infinite maybes. Not silicon, but atoms. Not circuits, but probability. Somewhere in a silent lab, a device already exists that doesn't just solve problems. It rewrites them. Subconsciously, put in a method to the madness. Computers need an algorithm. Governments want it. Corporations fear it. And if it works, nothing, no code, no cure, no constant, will be safe from its reach. Fold shiny thing, they think this is a quantum computer. That's actually not true. This is the quantum computer. This isn't science fiction anymore. This is quantum. And we're closer to reshaping our reality than anyone dares to admit. The ultimate computer. The digital age transformed our world. It reshaped industry, medicine, communication, everything. But now, something even bigger is brewing, not faster. Fundamentally different. Quantum computers don't run on silicon logic. They compute using the actual laws of the universe. While digital systems rely on electricity switching between ones and zeros, quantum systems process information using particles, electrons, and atoms, operating under the strange rules of quantum mechanics. This is not just an upgrade, it's a new species of machine, and everyone knows it. Google, IBM, Microsoft, the Pentagon, the Chinese military, the world's top universities. They're all chasing it because the first to achieve dominance in quantum computing could control everything from finance to warfare to the very infrastructure of the Internet. Miss this revolution and you don't just lose your edge, you risk irrelevance. Some even say that if a country or tech sector misses this wave, it could collapse entirely. Imagine Silicon Valley as a ghost town. That's how big the stakes are. Because this isn't about making computers better. It's about creating something so powerful, so fundamentally alien to what came before, that it redefines what computing even means. Quantum computers aren't the next step. They're the last step, the final frontier of information itself. Analog Origins Long before anyone imagined digital circuits or electric pulses, humans were building computers, just not the kind we recognize today. They were simple at first. Bones with carved notches, wooden rods to tally goods. Stones are arranged to count the passing of seasons. These were analog computers built to measure, track, and represent the world in continuous forms. But then something remarkable emerged from the past. In 1901, sponge divers off the coast of Greece found a corroded bronze object in a Roman shipwreck. What looked like a lump of metal turned out to be something extraordinary. Once cleaned, it revealed an intricate network of gears, dozens of them precisely interlocked. This was the Antikythera mechanism, a 2,000-year-old machine that predicted eclipses and planetary motions, a physical simulation of the heavens. Centuries later, Charles Babbage dreamed of something greater. His difference engine, a massive, steam-powered machine of levers and gears, could calculate mathematical tables. It was the most ambitious analog device of its time. But gears had limits. The world was changing too fast. When World War II broke out, the battle shifted to something mechanical gears couldn't win. To defeat encrypted codes and hidden messages, humanity would need more than cranks and wheels. It needed a new kind of machine and a new kind of logic. Rise of the Digital Era World War II didn't just test nations, it tested technology. Analog machines with their wheels and gears had served well. But they were too slow, too fragile, too limited. The stakes were higher now. Messages had to be decrypted. Codes broken. Lives saved. Enter Alan Turing. Turing wasn't building a better gear system. He was redefining what a machine could be. His vision gave birth to the first digital computer, a device that didn't rely on physical parts to represent information, but symbols, zeros, ones, logic gates. Electrical pulses flickered faster than any lever could move. Every digital computer since, your phone, your laptop, your server farm, can trace its lineage back to that moment. That logic became the language of progress. Bits, binary digits, rule this world. Each bit is a switch, on or off, true or false. With enough bits, you can simulate anything, or so we thought. We built supercomputers, networks, clouds, but now we're approaching the physical limits. 
Transistors are nearing the atomic scale. Signals start to blur. Errors multiply. Moore's law is slowing down. And underneath all of it, a deeper truth is surfacing. The universe doesn't think in ones and zeros. It thinks in probabilities, in waves, in uncertainty. And to truly compute like nature, we'll have to leave the digital age behind. The Quantum Leap It started with a question, how small can you make a transistor? That's what Richard Feynman asked. The answer changed everything. Because at the atomic level, things don't behave the way we expect. They don't stay in one place. They don't follow a single path. They exist in a cloud of probabilities. Feynman realized something profound. If you want to simulate nature, you have to use the rules nature plays by. Classical computers based on bits just aren't enough. That's when the idea of quantum computing was born. Instead of binary bits, quantum computers use qubits. A qubit doesn't just hold a zero or a one, it holds both in a state called superposition. And if two qubits become entangled, they behave as one, no matter how far apart they are. This isn't a metaphor. It's measurable. It's real. With every added qubit, the power of the system grows, not linearly, but exponentially. That's why quantum computers are different. They don't follow a single route to a solution. They explore every route at once. They don't replace digital computers. They go beyond them. This isn't evolution. It's a rupture, a shift from logic to possibility, from certainty to the raw unpredictability that defines reality itself. What is a qubit? In a digital world, everything is rigid. A bit is either on or off, zero or one, no in-between. But quantum mechanics doesn't care about rigid. It operates in the gray zone, in maybes, probabilities, and blurred boundaries. That's where the qubit lives. Picture a spinning coin. While it's in the air, it's both heads and tails. That's superposition. A qubit exists in multiple states until it's observed. Then it collapses into one reality. But the magic isn't just in superposition. It's in entanglement. When two qubits become entangled, they share a connection so deep that changing one affects the other instantly, even across great distances. This isn't science fiction. It's been proven again and again in quantum labs. Entangled qubits work together, forming complex networks of probability. Each qubit adds layers of exponential complexity. With just 300 qubits, a quantum computer could represent more values than there are atoms in the visible universe. But none of this works like a traditional computer. You don't write instructions in the same way. You set up a wave of possibilities and let the system interfere with itself. The right answers reinforce. The wrong ones cancel out. It's not just code. It's choreography. A quantum ballet of infinite outcomes collapsing into a single solution. Parallel universes in a chip. There's a thought experiment that haunts physics. It involves a cat, a sealed box, and quantum uncertainty. Inside the box is a cat, a vial of poison, and a quantum trigger that may or may not release it. Until you open the box, the cat isn't just alive or dead. It's both, simultaneously. This is Schrodinger's cat, and it's not a joke. It's how reality works at the quantum level. That idea, superposition, is what gives quantum computers their power. Each qubit is like Schrodinger's cat. It doesn't choose a state until observed. Until then, it exists in a spread of all possible outcomes. Now imagine not just one cat, but hundreds, thousands, all entangled, all interacting. That's a quantum computer, a machine that doesn't just test one outcome at a time, it tests all of them at once. Every possible combination of data is explored in parallel. It's not computing in a straight line. It's exploding outward into every possibility and then collapsing into a final answer when the system is measured. Some physicists even say this process touches parallel universes. Each calculation, they suggest, branches reality itself. Maybe that's poetic. Maybe it's literal. But one thing's certain. This isn't the kind of computer you can hold in your lap. 
It's the kind that rewrites what reality can be. Quantum Speed versus Digital Limit Speed alone doesn't make a revolution. But quantum computers don't just run faster, they run differently. Let's say you give a problem to a supercomputer. It breaks the task into pieces and solves each one step by step in blazing fast succession. Still, it's working linearly, one solution at a time. A quantum computer does something else entirely. Thanks to superposition and entanglement, it can evaluate countless paths simultaneously. It's like reading every possible page of a book at once and understanding the entire story instantly. Google demonstrated this with their machine named Sycamore. It solved a problem in 200 seconds that would have taken the world's fastest classical computer 10,000 years. That's not just an upgrade, that's a milestone. This moment is known as quantum supremacy, the point at which a quantum machine outperforms the best digital one at a specific task. But the true goal lies ahead, quantum advantage. That's when quantum computers solve practical, real-world problems. Classical computers simply can't. We're not quite there. Yet. Qubits are still fragile. Noise still threatens calculations. Quantum computers compute on parallel universes. That's why they are so powerful. And large-scale systems are still experimental. But every month, new breakthroughs arrive. More qubits, better error correction, greater stability. And when does quantum advantage become routine? it will feel less like a step forward and more like teleportation. The problem of decoherence. There's a catch, a cruel one. Quantum systems are fragile, too fragile. The moment you disturb them, the whole calculation can collapse. This is called decoherence. It's the biggest obstacle in the field. You see, for quantum computing to work, all qubits must stay in perfect harmony, coherent, vibrating together like the strings of a single instrument. But heat, light, and even a stray vibration can throw them off. They lose their rhythm, they go out of tune. And when that happens, they fall back into randomness. Noise. So researchers trap qubits in superconducting circuits. They cool them to near absolute zero because only in that icy silence can qubits stay focused. It's like trying to perform surgery during an earthquake. You need stillness, you need precision, and you need to keep it that way for every nanosecond of computation. That's the challenge. That's why quantum computers still look like golden chandeliers in vacuum chambers. They're not ready for your desk, not yet. Nature's quantum secret. Here's the twist no one saw coming. Nature already solved the quantum problem. While scientists build massive cryogenic systems to stabilize qubits, Plants are doing quantum magic in broad daylight, literally. Photosynthesis, the process by which leaves convert sunlight into energy, uses quantum coherence. When sunlight hits a chlorophyll molecule, the energy doesn't travel in a straight line. It explores all possible paths at once. And the fastest, most efficient path? That's the one that sticks. Sound familiar? That's a quantum algorithm happening in a leaf at room temperature. Birds might use entanglement to navigate across continents. Enzymes may rely on quantum tunneling to accelerate biochemical reactions. There's even a theory that our sense of smell uses quantum vibrations. Nature doesn't freeze its systems or isolate them in chambers. It lets quantum behavior exist in warm, noisy, living environments. That's the blueprint we've barely started to read. If we can learn from biology, if we can mimic nature's methods, we may build quantum systems that don't need extreme cooling or perfect isolation. Systems that are resilient, adaptive, and maybe even organic. The future of quantum computing might not look like rows of golden wires. It might look like life, messy, complex, but quantum to its core. The future they could unlock. Quantum computers aren't just about speed, they're about access. To problems we couldn't even attempt before. Take farming. The Green Revolution helped feed billions, but it's slowing down. Quantum models might crack how to synthesize ammonia more efficiently. That could reshape fertilizer production, cut emissions, and boost food security. Take energy. Fusion power, the holy grail of clean energy, needs real-time modeling of chaotic plasma. 
Classical computers struggle. Quantum machines could bring it within reach. Now, take medicine. Diseases like Alzheimer's and cancer start at the molecular level. To fight them, we need to understand how molecules fold, twist, and react. Digital models are too limited. But quantum computers speak the same language as those molecules. They don't guess. They emulate. They become the molecules. We could discover new drugs, tailor treatments, predict side effects before a pill is even made. And beyond all that, some physicists dream even bigger. A single equation to unify gravity and quantum mechanics. A theory of everything. And the only mind capable of solving it might be a machine. This isn't about computers anymore. It's about reality. And who gets to rewrite it? Quantum computing isn't a distant future. It's already humming quietly in labs around the world. Learning. Growing. Preparing. It may cure the incurable, crack the uncrackable, or collapse under its own complexity. But if it works, every problem could bend. And every answer we seek might already be waiting in the quantum noise. The question isn't if it's coming. The question is, when the quantum future arrives, will we be ready?